Zanskar is a veritable Shangri-La. Surrounded by high mountains, it can only be accessed over high and dangerous passes for a few months each year during the summers. The passes that ring Zanskar seem to echo out of history. The Omasi La, the Poth La, the Kang La from the Miyar Nala near Udaipur, the Shingo La, and further to the east, the Phirse La. The only motor access into Zanskar if this track can be labelled by such a dignified appellation, is over the Pensila at 14,000 feet, coming in from the Suru Valley. The Suru, a little known but large river, from which the valley takes its name, flows south to north, one of the peculiarities of the left bank tributaries of the Indus. <laughs> The Suru Valley represents the easternmost extension of Islam in the Himalaya. The people of Balti origin are Shias, as can be discerned from the photos of Ayatollah Khomeini plastered all over this village mosque. A sort of crossroads between the Muslim and Buddhist regions of the Himalaya, the Suru Valley also gives us a first views of Zanskar's famous mountains, Nun and Kun. Various high mountains have acted as magnets to different nationalities and have come to be associated with them as national obsessions. Particularly the Germans with Nanga Parbat and the Japanese here with Nun and Kun. Large numbers have perished on the perilous slopes and faces, yet the mountain remains an irresistible attraction. This is glacier country, with the valleys having been gouged out by long extinct glaciers. Not all are extinct though. With ice walls stretching hundreds of feet, the Rangri glacier debouches straight from noon into the Suru river itself. In one of the most amazing sights in the Himalaya, if you are lucky enough to witness it, large chunks of the glacier crash straight into the river. Gateway to Zanskar and an indication of the start of Buddhist regions is the Ringdom Gompa, overlooked by a fantastically striated pyramidal mountain, its sedimentary layers clearly visible. Ringdom is an orthodox Gelugpa monastery standing right on the frontier of the Himalayan Buddhist regions, the easternmost Gompa in the Himalayan region. Here onwards, the comparative lushness of the Suru gives way to Zanskar's bleak landscape, which by the way is also deceptive. Zanskar is home to myriads of high altitude flower species, all the more striking in the general barrenness of the terrain. This is a comparatively rare species, Aconitum violaceum. Sitting here in Upper Zanskar in this alpine meadow 
And this flower around me is uh, the Himalayan Edelweiss, Leontopodium Himalayans, which was made famous by the song from The Sound of Music. And incidentally, it's also the national flower of Switzerland. The inconspicuous blossoms are born in heads surrounded by woolly petal-shaped leaves. The Edelweiss is a frost-loving high-altitude species and grows best in coarse, sandy loam. Honey from Edelweiss blossoms is highly prized by the connoisseurs, though Zanskar produces none that we could get hold of. High, cold and barren though it is, Zanskar is nevertheless a load of minerals and metals of all descriptions, often leached out of the rock by the action of ice and water. As its name translates, Zanskar or Copper Star was, in centuries past, known throughout Ladakh and western Tibet for its whitish copper. This copper comes down through Zanskar's many streams and rivulets and is used primarily for making vessels. The rocks in Zanskar are largely sedimentary in nature and comprise the layers of the original Tethyan Ocean. Now, uh, this rock over here uh, has a large number of garnets, which are semi-precious stones, embedded into it. And some of the other rocks here in this glacial moraine where I'm sitting uh, include um, this uh, quartzite, which has a very high silica content in it, and um, a ferrite rock over here, and so forth. For here, 60 million year old Tethyan sediments have buckled and contorted with even older crystalline formations, perhaps two billion years old, rearing through in the south. Zanskar is thus rich in fossil-bearing sediments like the grey olive slates. The Doda Valley, due to its glacial origins, is a fairly wide valley, while the Lugnok, for most of its course, is a tremendous gorge. In winter, the Zanskar River is Zanskar's only access route. When the ice freezes thick on the river, it becomes a highway known as the Chadar Road straight to Saspul in the Indus Valley.
Earlier, travelers reported a highly insular society. People were genuinely scared of strangers and generally closed their doors if a stranger happened by. Things have changed in the 80s though, since Zanskar was first open to tourism. Nowadays in the 90s, the younger generation look like they could be youngsters anywhere in India. Its remoteness, coupled with a certain amount of stepmotherly treatment, makes Zanskar one of the least developed regions in the country today. This is Padam, the capital, scarcely distinguishable from any other bucolic village. No telephone, no TV, electricity for only two hours a day and a general absence of any civic amenities whatsoever. The total population of Zanskar is barely over 10,000 people, giving it one of the lowest population densities in India. This has been another factor behind the low developmental priority accorded to the area. Of no interest to the army, it has also not benefited from defense infrastructure like Ladakh and other frontier Himalayan areas. The Zanskaris are a cheerful lot in spite of their extreme situation. This young man's story is typical of the hardships endured by the people here in their effort to be a part of the national mainstream. <laughs> We Zanskaris have to put up with great difficulties. I am a teacher here on ad hoc basis and also I am studying in Delhi University's Kerori Mal College. To go to college, I have to go to Manali via the 17,000 foot high Shingo Pass. It is a very tough trek with many river crossings where the water reaches up to our chest. I study in Delhi during the winter months and in May I return via Kargil. That is also a tough journey for we have to wait for a vehicle to reach Parkachik from where we walk. Travel is only possible during early mornings for later the snow melts and there is danger of avalanches. We spend the night on the road with a blanket wherever we can find a spot clear of snow. The mainstay of life in Zanskar is the intense religiosity of the people and their relationship to the monastery. There are nine major gampas or monasteries in Zanskar and dozens of smaller village ones. Every Buddhist family is affiliated to some monastery situated near the village. Usually, according to the Lamaistic tradition, the youngest son from every family is sent to the monastery as a novice Lama. The ties between the village and the monastery are bound not only by family linkages, but socio-economic ties as well. No function, ceremony or celebration 
is possible without the religious services of the lamas and even decisions like sowing seeds, harvesting, etc. are determined by the lamas sometimes after consulting the appropriate oracle. The institutional structure of Tibetan feudalism was carried over to Zanskar and thus the monasteries are substantive landholders. In Zanskar, where arable land is strictly limited, it has made for another powerful link with the villagers. For most of these lands are cultivated by them on behalf of the lamas. The monastery receives grain and butter in return. Butter, for the trans-Himalayan peoples, has meanings not understandable easily by others. Butter is an energy source as well as a light source for it fuels the countless little lamps found in all houses and bigger ones in the monastery. In the high cold altitudes that these people inhabit, butter is their most important source of dietary fat. Drunk in tea, a misnomer for it is more like a soup with butter and salt umpteen times a day. Butter is also applied as a salve on wounds and, of course, counts as the ultimate gift. The most valued butter is made from yak milk, which has a very high fat content. The butter is prepared communally in high altitude encampments, with each family contributing labor and animals. The share of each is decided according to the contribution made and the final divvying is done at the onset of winter. Very little is known about the history of Zanskar, but numerous rock carvings indicate a pre-Tibetan Buddhist culture, with cultural inspiration coming from the West, primarily from Buddhist Kashmir. The Kanika Stupa here at Sane is attributed to the Kushan Emperor Kanishka, though the evidence is less than certain. When Kashmir finally fell before Islamic forces in 1337 AD, its Buddhist influence on Ladakh and Zanskar declined rapidly. The vacuum was filled by Tibet. Zanskar, unlike Baltistan and Purig, was never converted to Islam and isolated by difficult ranges and fearsome gorges, has remained Buddhist country to this very day. It is in the great gompas of Zanskar that the cultural traditions of the people are made manifest and are preserved. Karsha, across the valley from Padam, is further than it looks in the crystal clear trans Himalayan atmosphere. Karsha is the largest Gelugpa monastery in Zanskar. Its foundation attributed to the great translator Rinchen Sangpo. The Gelugpa are the orthodox sect of Tibetan Buddhism owing allegiance to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Some of the finest examples of mural art in Zanskar are to be found here in Karsha. Housed in a large structure called Labrang, which can only be accessed from the roof, they represent five different Buddha manifestations.
This mural depicts the four-headed Virochna, Milarepa, the greatest ascetic of them all, Songkhapa, the great reformer. A clumsy restoration was luckily halted on the orders of the new Rinpoche and priceless elements of Zanskar's artistic heritage preserved for the future. This, the Amitabha Buddha, in his paradise abode of Sukhvati, flanked by two bodhisattvas. Here is an unusual one of the Buddha as Nagaraja with snakes coiled along his arms, shoulders and head. Karsha today is a vibrant monastery with hundreds of resident monks, a veritable city within. Perched atop a crag overlooking the Lingti Lugnok, the Bardhan Gompa has the appearance of a small fortress. Founded in the mid-17th century, local lore has it that the Gompa was shifted to its present location from higher up the gorge due to persistent attacks by bandits. The presence of an old muzzle loader with the llamas tends to give the story weight, for it is an unusual sight indeed. A llama with a gun Bardhan is a Kargyupa center affiliated to Stakna and draws inspiration from the great guru Milarepa. Beautiful contemporary tankhas inside the Sanctum Sanctorum detail the various events in the life of the master, Mila. Gompa architecture follows the Tibetan pattern, imposing and striking from the exterior. The interiors are, however, not homey in any sense of the word. Dark, long corridors, equally dark prayer halls with very few windows to conserve heat and probably also to keep the atmosphere as austere as possible. Actually, what with murals and stucco figurines leering at you out of the gloom. Living here for a lifetime 
must be quite a surreal experience. Bardhan caps it all with its weird animal exhibits. This is Sankhu, the local wolf, with a fox in between. In the high alpine meadows, around 13,000 feet and above, are found the marmots. About the size of a large house cat, they live colonially in patches of subalpine meadow and talus slopes. There are 14 marmot species in the world. In fact, the Vancouver Island marmot is the rarest mammal in the North Americas. Arctomys himalianus, or the Himalayan marmot, is a distinct species, although it is closely related to the woodchuck, the hoary marmot, and the yellow-bellied marmot. Most marmots live in mountainous habitats. The marmot's scientific name means mountain mouse. Marmots live in small groups called colonies. Their homes have intricate underground burrows, including rest areas, hibernation chambers, and a bathroom. Mm -hmm. 